listening to Neo Cash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. In the studio with you, it's JJ, Darren, and Pedro. Russia expedited crypto adoption and a burger-backed crypto. Gold prices rise along with saber rattling. All this and more here on episode 221, Wednesday, August 30th, 2017. In the traditional markets, we have gold up to $1,308. Uh, silver's up to $17.37. Oil is down to $45.96, and the Dow is up to 21,892 points, and the 30-year Treasury yield is down to 2.74%. In the crypto markets, we have Bitcoin up to $4,543. Bitcoin Cash is down to $569. Litecoin is up to $62.41. Ethereum up to $376, and Dash is up to $365. Thanks, guys. Just a reminder, you can tune into Neocash Radio every Wednesday night. Don't want to miss a single moment of awesome Neocash content, including special episodes and bonus interviews. Subscribe to our podcast on Google Play Music, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, YouTube, Podcast Addict, and more. Well, starting out the show today, right at the top here, we have the gold price reaches a year high after North Korea fires missile over Japan. So the latest provocation from North Korea has a missile test flight that lands uh, past the island of Japan. It crashed in the ocean. The next North Korea state uh, media claims that the next missile will go to Guam. And the U.S., of course, President Donald Trump warns the next missile launch will be met with a fire and fury. Uh, this may be a leading contributor to the recent rise in the price of gold. The same could be said for cryptocurrencies. They call it a flight to haven assets. War and conflict typically drives up the price of gold as the risk of an invest investment outweighs the safety of gold. This could also help explain the rise in the price of Bitcoin. As of this episode, though, the average Bitcoin transaction fee is at $38, which is saying something, Darren. When you have yeah. the price of Bitcoin continuing to rise to these new highs, and yet the average that is being paid... Now, obviously, not everybody's paying this amount, but the right. average price... Per, for a single transaction, it's thirty-eight dollars. And then um, on <clears throat> particular blocks, I mean, we did see the uh, the, the price get up to five dollars on average, and uh, and and the median is uh, pretty high too. So, um, so it's it's just it, it I it doesn't really make too much sense, but I will just go along with it because that's what the market has given what, us. <laughs> well, uh, one thing that I would notice JJ that with the price rise it basically spiked all in one uh one hour or so and uh I I looked at Bitfinex uh on Twitter and he yeah. said yeah another million dropped in the market uh th this also could be fueled by fake money so but, you're saying that a million tethers came out and then in, yeah. into the market and is then it, bought bitcoin well yeah they come out in the market and then what they do is they lend them out so basically, now all this extra dollar or tethers are available for lending on Bitfinex, and that can, and so people took these loans and bought Bitcoin with it. Yeah. So. Well, we've already talked at length about Bitfinex and how uh, we believe that some of the activity there could be very uh, malicious or wrong or fraudulent or incompetent, any number of things. But it's uh, let's move on to other stories. Um, so, uh, Pedro, you got a story here for us. Sure. Uh, the SEC may suspend trading of stocks for companies that engage in token offerings. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission has released an alert concerning stock trading suspensions for businesses engaged in token offerings. On August 28th, the U.S. Security and, uh, Securities and Exchange Commission issued an investor alert warning about the potential scams relating to token offerings and discussing potential trading suspensions. In the announcement, the SEC said it suspends the trading in a stock in order to protect investors and the public interest. Specifically, the SEC stated that trading suspension may occur if there is insufficient information about a company, such as if the company fails to file extended or periodic reports, or there are questions over the accuracy of publicly available information, including press releases and company reports. Also, if there are questions about the trading of stocks, such as possible market manipulation, ambiguities about the stock, or the ability to settle and clear transactions in the stock, suspension may occur as well. According to the alert, quote, the SEC recently issued several trading suspensions on the common stock of certain issuers who made claims regarding their investments in ICOs or uh, truncated coin token-related news. 
The companies affected by trading suspensions include First Bitcoin Capital Corporation, CIAO Group, Strategic Global, and Sunshine Capital. So, wow, Pedro. Yeah, what it appears is happening here is the SEC is, is, is telling companies that have traditional securities traded on traditional uh, exchanges that if they get into these initial coin offerings, even if it's part of a investment portfolio on their part to their customers, that they may suspend the overlying stock if they don't feel certain conditions are being met as is expected for traditional wow. securities. Talk about some coercion. I mean, it's like toe the line or we're going to not let you guys trade your common stock on our exchanges at our privilege. Oh, geez. Yeah, not good. I, I, I never like seeing things like this. Well, and we'll, we'll, talk, we'll touch on later in the show how Russia is taking a completely different tactic, but more on the sort of similar subject. And uh, in fact, the SEC report actually was talking about pump and dumps as well and, and some of that stuff. And we talk about that on the show. That does happen in the cryptosphere. There are scams. There are pumps. There are manipulations that occur. In fact, we talked about Bitfinex just in the last story as a potential scammy manipulator. So uh, this story here is is not meant to be an indictment, but we're talking about storage and the development well. And this is last, this last week, there was a story published where someone was attempting to use the storage network. The author successfully uploads a photo and then gets stuck trying to upload the five gigabit file, five gigabyte file he was testing. He also attempts to run storage without the central server, and that doesn't work at all. Uh, this comes after their main developer, Book Chin, left the team, setting issues with the remaining leadership. Looking at the GitHub activity logs, Book Chin seems to have done most of the coding. And back in May of this year, Storage ran an Ethereum token sale, raising $30 million. And since that time, the GitHub activity has died down to almost nothing. In fact, this week, there's no activity in my most recent check. Uh, with Bookchin gone, they are looking for more developers. Now, this isn't a concrete judgment of Storage, but rather a cautionary advisory. I just want to point out now that when Storage was planning their ICO, they did raise the cap several times up to the $30 million mark. I believe it went up twice. So uh, so they raised $30 million in Ether back when Ether was $177. Well, obviously, that's gone up twice as much now. So this, is a, this story is bigger than storage and includes many newly funded projects. The gap between the ICO and the finished project is the development well. Getting the core software operational, getting the user interface functional, and it bug fixing can require massive amounts of time. The more complex the project is, the longer it will take. This development well can trap some projects, dooming them to failure or excruciating delays. Money alone isn't going to magically solve problems. Having a good and respected leadership is key. Having good developers is key. Having a good strategy is key. And there are more keys. Think about it this way. A new blockchain or token project has to basically create a fully functional business. Leadership, accounting, public relations, marketing, legal, and human resources are all needed to address needed to be addressed and handled, handled well. Smaller projects and teams may not need to hire other people, but now you have fewer people to pull away from the actual work that needs to be done. It's not just people who gamble on the ICO or token sale that need to be cautious. Many projects are and have been in the development well for a while, and some still have nothing to show for it. If you choose to gamble, be sure to do some research first. So it's a cautionary tale, if you will, about the, uh, the issues that and very real. And, and we talk about this once again on the show. It's, it's not necessarily a scam. It's not necessarily malicious. But let's say a project bit off more than they can chew. And they don't have a good strategy for deploying their project or completing it or uh, getting the, GU- the GUI, the graphical user interface, to function properly. And, and there's bugs that plague it. And, you know, th- there's so many different things that can either delay or, or fail a project entirely. So, and, and those things can obviously cause a big effect on the price of that coin. Right. They can so uh, moving on here, we've got some Dash news. Darren, do you want to tell us the Dash news? Sure. Um, Dash is uh, partnering with Arizona State University, uh, building the future of money requires, m- requires more people learn how to build and maintain black- blockchain technology. Dash is partnering with ASU Engineering Department to build the Blockchain Research Lab. 
Dash is the blockchain for the masses. It is impressive for several reasons. The instant transactions and since then is a very important feature that meets the most demanding need of practical business applications. And that's a, a quote from Dragon uh, Boskovic, uh, the technical director of Cascade Research Labs at ASU. Yeah, so the Cascade Research Lab is where the, uh, the blockchain research lab will happen. And I don't know if that's actually what they're going to call it. Yeah, but, it's um, it basically it'll all be behind the scenes, and uh, we'll, we're going to figure out how to make Dash work the best it can. Excellent. Yeah. So, then he mentioned the instant send, but uh, currently, yeah, currently uh, Dash instant send is disabled. So, um, so there was a post on the forum uh, today, JJ, that said that uh, that that we, meaning Dash, like to inform you. Uh, with help from the community, we have discovered a potential exploit in the current instant send implementation, which provides a chance for an attacker with six or more master nodes to dominate an instant send quorum and brute by brute forcing collateral transactions hashes in a certain way as to increase their chance to be selected for an instant send quorum. Uh, we have not yet seen this attack ex- executed on our network. And we believe the risks are low because the exploit requires ownership with, of at least 2.1 million in Dash. However, uh, for safety, we have disabled instant send um, to ensure this attack cannot be performed until the fixed, which, um, which is already completed, uh, quality insurance, uh, and, it, it, and released to the network. Wow. Well, thanks for that, Darren. Yes. It's, it's good to... Uh, Get, so, get an update on what's going on yeah, with that. Yeah, you should expect two weeks. Uh, uh, when 12.2 comes out, that's going to have the fix in it as well. So they're just going to bundle it with everything else. But I did that quote from uh, Dra- Dragan. Yeah, uh, let's say Dragon. Dragan. Dragon. Uh, Boscovic. Uh, mm-hmm. That's really important to note, though, that instant send is what businesses want. I mean, that yeah. that is exactly what businesses want, confirmation. Uh, just like a credit card would give them confirmation, right? So, uh, so all right, let's get Darren. Do we have an internet? Uh, sorry, a uh, update on Bitcoin Cash? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, if you listen to last week, uh, there, you know, there was a lot of crazy stuff going on at Bitcoin Cash, and so uh, this week there was an emergency difficulty adjustment that caused Bitcoin Cash to be more profitable mine compared to Bitcoin. Uh, the lower difficulty period was burned through at as almost half the miners jumped on to mine Bitcoin Cash. Uh, after this period, there were more emergency difficulty adjustments, adjustments but Chinese mine BTC Top uh, actually uh, mined a few blocks and prevented uh, the Bitcoin Cash difficulty from dropping uh, low enough to be more profitable than mining Bitcoin. Currently, there are enough miners on the Bitcoin Cash network to mine uh, maybe about two to four blocks an hour. Uh, Bitcoin difficulty is expected to go up in less than a week. Uh, in less than two weeks, I would expect, or less than two weeks after that, I would expect that Bitcoin cash difficulty would go lower and then it would be more profitable to not mine Bitcoin cash. Uh, certainly, uh, certainly a calm before the storm, JJ. Yeah. Well, we talked about, well, not we talked, I guess I, I, you know, looking at the, you know, I look at uh, fork.lol and I see the the difference in hashing and then, and then you know, the network power yeah. and such like that. That's a great website. <laughs> yeah, forklol. I love that top level domain, lol. That's great. So it's, it's seeing, watch, you can sort of watch how the difficulty adjustments directly influence the mining and, and that sort of... Uh, sort of back and forth that's going on and, and yes it sort of was seeming like as soon as the the uh, the difficulty adjustment kicked in there was almost no power mining the bitcoin cash uh blockchain and it it you know a risk comes to mind for me is that well you know it's not so difficult the 51 percent attack a chain that no one is mining on Right. Uh, yeah. That. That's. You know. You. You basically just have to mine a block, and then you have to say <laughs> this is what the block is. Yeah. If you mine two blocks, I mean, the, the, yeah, the Bitcoin Cash network goes about twelve hours with very few blocks. So if somebody had two percent of the network, is what I estimated, it wouldn't be very hard to uh, have a chain that you've concealed and not released, and as soon as a block pops up, uh, put your chain over it. 
So, uh, right. yeah. So, so, it's not so, the so do you think in two weeks thing. when when the the difficulty drops and it's more profitable to buy in Bitcoin Cash that this problem will go away? Um, well, if the prices stay exactly where they are, and I have no reason to believe that they'll go up or down, um, then what what will happen is that a bunch of Bitcoin will jump on Bitcoin Cash. At least that's what happened in the past. And then uh, they'll burn through that lower difficulty period very quickly, and then the difficulty will be way up. So uh, basically, it's going to be very hard to mine a block, and every you know all the miners will go back to Bitcoin, or and and they will need another emergency difficulty adjustment uh, just to bring it down to something reasonable. That's what happened last time. So, yeah, I mean, it's not the best thing to have uh, around twelve hours with very few blocks coming out, but. Uh, but that's the, the blocks are big enough to to empty the mempool. Oh yeah, yeah. That's that's one th- good thing. Uh, interestingly enough, there's been several blocks mined over one megabyte today. Uh, there seems to be something funny going on with somebody producing large transactions. That's transactions over a kilobyte. However, the Bitcoin Cash chain keeps on humming despite many blocks over one megabyte. Uh, funny thing, JJ, the addresses. And some of those transactions are used on both sides of the fork. That is the same address as being used for Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash. Huh. So, yeah. So, so why do you think that is? Well, it's I, it's not what I would do. I would try to segregate my addresses, you know, keep them separate just, you know, for accounting and other reasons. But uh, Well, I, I think because know. Bitcoin Cash didn't change the naming architecture of their... Right. Their addresses, I mean, but yeah. So, so somebody's doing something on both sides of the fork, and uh, I mean, I I don't know why they're using a lot of script to hash addresses or the addresses that start with a three, and uh, I I can only speculate, uh, Pedro. Well, Darren, the future is here. Really? That's right, Darren. Burger King of Russia has partnered with the Waves platform to issue Whopper coins. Customers will receive one Whopper coin for each ruble they spend at Burger King. Once they've collected 1,700 Whopper coins, they can redeem them for a Whopper at, the par- at a participating restaurant. With all the claims about currencies being backed by an asset, I'm always left asking, quote, where can I redeem this for, for this for that? Well, with Whopper coin, it would seem that at least I can exchange it for a meal. So the world's first burger ba- burger backed crypto. How much how much is a ruble worth? So you get 59 rubles per dollar right now. And I calculated um I think it was uh, I'm I'm forgetting the 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 calculations but but basically you 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 essentially have a Whopper backed crypto as long as there are enough participating places and you can go to one you can consistently go and I'm, yeah. I'm exchange more or less you'd have to spend almost twenty nine dollars uh, and then you'd have enough for a free Whopper that's yes. not too bad well yeah, it seems like buy, buy ten get one free that's kind of what it reminds me of those punch cards yeah you yeah. know and so you're basically getting the eleventh for free but you can buy them on the market so I could. Maybe exactly. Buy my uh, crypto, my uh, burger Whopper coins cut quite cheaply, and then get my Whopper. Well, Darren, <laughs> this is my concern. <laughs> now, now, no, bear with me for a moment. Okay. My concern is that this gets adopted here in the United States. That'd be great. And then our one world currency is known as Whopper coin. <laughs> Stranger things have happened. I, I, out of all the currencies, why Whopper coin? <laughs> I don't know. Because I mean, you can put food in your belly with it. That's true. Well, <laughs> and, 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 and it, you know, it's, it got, it's backed against inflation. That sounds pretty So good. this is on the Waves platform. Uh, we've, we've talked about the Waves platform in an interview with the Tokes platform. And uh, they're, the, the Russians, this is their pretty much their biggest... Uh, a quote unquote a computer a competitor to Ethereum. So, uh, well, another story. Om, Om, Omi Say Go, I always screw up that name. Omi Say Go has formally announced a partnership with McDonald's of Thailand, which is huge news. They also have released their wallets, a software developer kit. So, they, they make basically a white label wallet. You can take their software developer kit and you can make it look like a Mick wallet. Basically, <laughs> so b- really big news if they get the McDonald's to come on board in Thailand and it works once again. What what our, our world are gonna currencies drive crypto. are be fast food currencies? This is ridiculous. <laughs> I always thought there would be Walmart coin. 
Oh, jeez. At some point. If there's going to be any food coin, it should be coffee coin. But, you know, honestly, honestly, okay, with all the heavy talk, last two episodes, we're really heavy. One episode we talked about Bitfinex being uh, probably a scoundrel. And then the next episode we talked about most most assuredly how the Bitcoin.org and our Bitcoin spaces were censorship uh, spaces. They were they're definitely not cypherpunk. They were um, they were manipulating the narrative. That's oh, what yes. they were doing. Chicanery, deception. Yes. So um, having this sort of news, this lighthearted, oh, with all the great things Bitcoin is doing, I could easily see each of these just being able to become far more uh, uh, far higher adoption far higher usage far higher velocity of money yeah i mean so. if i could get my mick coins and get my mick nuggets i think that'd be all right <laughs> right all right so uh uh just a reminder um we've got a russian language podcast and you can check out neocashradio.com click on the russian in the language selector and we've got some russian stories here yeah, so I'm going to apologize to our listeners. Uh, I, I really need to take some uh, basic conversational Russian, so I'm going to be butchering some names here. So Russia's Venikano Bank to develop government applications for blockchain tech with Ethereum Foundation. Wow. Ethereum co-founder Vitalik Buterin and Venice, let's just say this bank, Chairman Sergio Gorkov signaled the partnership agreement between the bank and the Ethereum Foundation on August 29th at a ceremony that took place during the, quote, blockchain, new oil of Russia, end quote, conference. Russian state-sponsored development bank. and Venetia Konovank. Venetia Konovank. Uh, and the Ethereum Foundation entered into an agreement to work together to develop a distributed registry and Ethereum platform, grow an expert Ethereum community, and implement training and educational programs at the bank's Competence Center, which is set to open in September 2017 at the National University of Science and Technology in Moscow. Speaking about the partnership, Vitalik Buterin, who signed the agreement on behalf of the Ethereum Foundation, said, quote, Cooperation between Ethereum and VEB gives a unique opportunity to engage in research and development on the use of blockchain technology for public administration and accelerate the adoption of this technology to government organizations in the Russian Federation, end quote. Well, this is big stuff out of Russia. So this is sort of like, um, in a way, it's there's a little bit of the story of the ASU uh, working with Dash here, but it's even bigger than that because this, is, this isn't a university, it's a bank. But but what's our next story, Pedro? Our next story is Moscow Stock Exchange welcomes cryptocurrency trade. This is from Forbes.com. You can soon trade digital currencies against paper currency on the Moscow Stock Exchange, if you're a qualified investor, that is. In doing so, Russia is the first stock exchange to make cryptocurrency a new investable asset. Russia's Deputy Minister of Finance, Alexei Mosekovev, told Rosea24 on Tuesday that the RTS Minsk was the was only allowing for qualified investors to trade in cryptocurrency in order to avoid large money laundering operations. Qualified investors in Russia need to have at least 6 million rubles in personal assets or 200 million rubles for investment firms. Quote, recognizing the extraordinary popularity of cryptocurrencies among Russian users, some of the Russian regulators are lobbying a permissive rather than a prohibitive approach to the new technology, says Ander Babev, co-founder of ICO Box in Moscow. Quote, they are cautiously moving towards adopting new laws to embrace blockchain and make it a national priority, end quote. ICO Box helps companies standardize the ICO process, which is the IPO of the cryptocurrency in the blockchain developers' new virtual world. Wow, so the Moscow Stock Exchange is going to be trading, it's, it's, they're starting out with just Bitcoin, right, I think, uh, at first, and then the... To, to, the, to big investors, right? right? They're starting with the big investors. Right. Well, to be fair, six million rubles is less than a million, or just about a million U.S. dollars. So, um, but the the comparing that with the first story of the day, uh, the SEC story, you know, in, in the U.S., if you have any, if you're a, you're a company that even talks about doing an engaging in an ICO, let alone having an ICO, then you can't even trade your common stock. In Russia, we're going to trade the actual cryptocurrency. I mean, th- this really is huge. This is akin to the Nasdaq, or you know, coming out and saying, "Hey, you can now trip, 
trade crypto right on our platform. This is huge news. It is. Yeah, so it's clear that that the U.S. is basically positioning itself to be the last place country when it comes to crypto. I mean, it's 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 sort of chilling, right? That you, we're here, we we are here in the United States, and we we are talking about our own ideas to create crypto companies and crypto endeavors. But then, you know, the elephant in the room, Pedro and and Darren, is the fact that we know that there could be some ruling that comes down that just makes all our hard work uh, for naught. And and the frustrating part about the U.S. compared to a lot of other countries like Germany and U.K. and Canada is there are different regulatory bodies come together and come out with a unified, um, you know, unified regulations as as it pertains to to cryptocurrencies, whereas here in the U.S., the IRS sees it as, you know, capital gains, FinCEN sees it as currency— and it's very difficult. I mean, you can hire the best attorneys, but you have to hope that they've read through every last page of every last regulation to make sure that you're complying. And it's just... It's not, it's, it, it could be even worse than that. You have to hope that the judge or, or whoever is moderating this event ha- has a good understanding of what's going on and doesn't have news from one side. You know what I'm saying? Like, or, or, or it has no idea whatsoever, and it basically just sides with, with the state prosecutor. I, I mean, we've talked about this in, in the past on the show where, you know, last year we, you know, the show went on and there's things to talk about. But now it's information and new advancements in the crypto space are coming out so fast. It's difficult for us to keep on top of everything. So, yeah, I, I can imagine a judge hear something and and they're getting the latest info and it's coming at a dizzying rate you know by default they might just say well i you know it's a coin flip so i'm just going to go with the regulators right exactly that's that's the concern is that instead of spending the time and effort to figure this out and actually I mean, let's face it here that you have to know an awful lot to understand some of these things and especially especially the newest ones that are coming out now. In many cases, there's not only new technology being involved, but there's new ways of applying old technology. And so, like uh, ZK Snarks, for example, I, I, you know, I kind of understand what the idea is, is that you're proving something without re- showing what you know, but I don't understand exactly how they work. You know what I'm saying? Like that, and, and I've been covering this for, we've been, we've been on the, the Neocache for, for almost four and a half years. So it's, it's just like, well, how do I expect the regulators, let alone the judges, let alone the jury, to even understand enough to make a competent decision? And then that's really the, the issue, is that I don't think you can get a competent decision from anyone regarding the crypto uh, world, because no one in the, in the regulatory scheme, in, in the judge, the uh, judicial branch of government, no one, I don't think, has that sort of information, that sort of knowledge that sort of depth of knowledge, especially, to make a concrete judgment or even a fair judgment. No, I really think they're, this is way over their heads. And, you know, I'm not saying that there aren't smart people in, in, in those places, but it's how much time are they going to have. They're investigating other financial things, and it might not always be crypto all the time. So if you're an agent and you get assigned, and, and now you get like a you know 400-page dossier of information you have to go through, and it's all, you know, really complicated Techno stuff, it, it'd probably be difficult for me to comprehend. Right. Darren, do you have anything to add here? Um, not really, no. Okay. Well. Yeah. I mean, that, that, that pretty much says it there. There we go. Um, let me just quick, uh, we have a disclaimer here. Um, let me just, there we go. Disclaimer time. Well, because we added a disclaimer to the show, any content on the Neocash Radio Podcast and our website should not be regarded as financial or legal advice. Please be mindful of any and all regulations regarding cryptocurrency in your particular jurisdiction. Never invest or gamble more than you're willing to lose and always safeguard digital currency by keeping it a wallet whose private keys you control. This is JJ. This is Darren. And Pedro. For Neocash Radio, where we discuss the future of money today. Hey, this week, check it out. I've got an interview with Barter Dex and coming out on Friday, I've got another interview. Surprise! Surprise!